We're back for our recap of the day 12 events and what a day here in Toronto. For the second time in a row, we are having a day of three, uh, three wins in the open section, um, which hugely impact the standings as now we're going to have a, lead, a tie for first between Hikaru Nakamura, Jan Nepomnesi, and Gukesh. Uh, Jan drew his game today against Prague, so Gukesh and Hikaru got a chance to catch up to him by virtue of winning their games. Karuana keeps pace by winning as well. So tournament is going in the best possible way in the women. We did have some uh, exciting games, but nothing really decisive at the top boards because Tan saved her losing position against the Limava and Lei did not win her winning position against Logno. So nothing really changed atop the leaderboard there. Tan is still leading by half a point. Lei is uh, at seven and a half out of 12. And there is still a really big gap between these two ladies and the chasing group at six points. So we expect it to be a fight between Tan and Lei for the first place in the women. Yeah, I mean, what an exciting day, especially in the open uh, section, because I think we finally set ourselves up for those last two rounds being ultra exciting with four real contenders for first place, just a half point separating three co-leaders. Uh, you know, you really can't draw it up better than this. So really excited for the conclusion to this tournament. But uh, Irina, the games today were definitely packed full of excitement. Yeah, I think the people who were trying to catch up to Jan came to win mm -hmm. and they all won. Yeah, they just, they all showed up. They were on a mission and Jan himself was the only one who didn't seem like he was really out to play or hunting for a specific result other than maybe a draw, which kind of made his intentions very clear today. And he eventually made it, despite the fact that we thought he was even on the suffering end of that with the white pieces. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his game with Prague was never something that we paid a lot of attention to. Um, he did, however, make that draw without too many problems. Right. So probably the game that from the get-go was looking really interesting was this game between Hikaru and Faruja. And we know Faruja is one of the more exciting players here, and he was up for a fight. Mm -hmm. um, he came out with a French defense, and Hikaru surprised us a little bit with the exchange French, but it was not meant to be a boring game as quickly White took some space on the queen side, came out with this unusual queen check idea, and um, all of these little ideas created an imbalance in the position. Faruja tried to break out with this move. Mm -hmm. And okay, then we had like a really tactical skirmish in the middle game that was so complicated. Truly, I think it all began with this um, crucial move by Hikaru Bishop F4, um, voluntarily sacrificing this C pawn. Ali Reza took it, and after Hikaru Castle, this is the skirmish I think you're referring to, where it seemed like every move here, something was loose, hanging, calculations on both sides. And when the dust settled, it was actually Hikaru that stood a little bit better, and he had that classic imbalance of two pieces for a rook, which he slowly had the, the job, tough job, of maneuvering into a victory, but through a series of kind of complicated moves, I would say he did a pretty good job. Yeah, he was doing great at some point, and then he played this surprising retreat with the bishop that we mm -hmm. weren't expecting at all because there was just no need for it. We thought he'd be like starting with a more aggressive check. Um, and this move kind of just gave up this pawn. Suddenly, Faruja was not doing so badly. Yeah, this was really, really nicely done. He just seized the moment. And if you're going to play bishop e1, let me take the pawn. And even though it's still two pieces for the rook, the a3 pawn is dropping. And so the computer is, is coming closer and closer to saying, well, this, this is just a draw. And I think we were actually feeling that Hikaru had messed up his advantage completely. And all of a sudden, Ali Reza, after getting to the time control here, which was a shock to us, instead of playing rook a1 and maybe just pushing the a pawn, kind of a simple plan here, mm -hmm. he kind of went a little kamikaze with g5, which was unprovoked, unnecessary, and 
unfortunately for him, maybe the, the final mistake that he was allowed to make. Yeah, then Hikaru played a very nice move G4, solidifying all these outpost squares for the knight. And actually, um, then he just brought his knight back to that outpost and didn't seem to have any problems winning this game. He's about to win the A pawn. Mm -hmm. And here, Ferruja resigned because this pawn will be captured. I mean, black is just down material. He'll eventually lose this one, get the knight out from the side of the board. Yeah, uh, barring the bishop e1 move from Hikaru, I think he actually played the same opening as Nepo today, but he played it with an intention to win. He had a clever opening idea. He was up for the tactics as well against a very tactically sharp player in Ferruja. And uh, honestly, a very deserved win for Hikaru, who always seems to come up in the clutch. Yeah, and then we had Gukesh uh, coming out with this unorthodox move in the Nimzo Indian. Mm -hmm. H6, definitely signaling his intention to create a fight right from the very start. They had, um, you know, just an unusual game with this balance of like double C pawns for white, but white has the bishop pair, white has like a nice pawn over here, black has a passive knight. Mm -hmm. So we thought this was a round balance, but we definitely thought Gukesh had chances to make something of it. He played this great move, b5, opening up the rook. Yeah, I think at this moment we kind of felt, okay, Gukesh is still here to play. Um, and a few moves down the line from here, that a pawn for white just disappeared. And it was uh, just taken off the board. It felt like uh, through a series of moves he was outplayed to the point where he felt he needed to give up the a pawn just to trade the queens. And it's amazing. You give a you know super grandmaster that one pawn, and it feels like okay, they're running away with the game because Gukesh felt like he never looked back from there. Yeah, it wasn't the simplest a technical task, but it did seem like he was just slowly outplaying White, and of course, the boss's position down upon here was not a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Black's pieces just got all the best squares on the board and just kept getting better and better and you can see here outpost for the knight outpost for the bishop extra pawn i mean and then gukesh won this position without a problem yeah and he he made the technique look easy from from this point as he did have that favorable pairing against nijat the lowest uh, rated uh, participant in the event and he capitalized on it and uh, oh, coming away with a win there is super important for his first place chances. Great conversion. And Fabiano's game was a little um, nerve wracking at some point, I would say. It seems like he had a really nice advantage out of the opening. Um, you know, poor Vidit was like moving his king from g8 to e8, not the kind of thing that you're, you dream about doing. Mm -hmm. But um, it did get sharp at some point. Fabiano got this. We loved his position when it got to this point, taking space on both sides of the board. Um, and we thought he was converting really nicely. Um, but somewhere around here, somehow, even though he had won a pawn, it started to get unclear. Yeah, this was... Uh... An unusual moment because Fabi had been displaying such good technique, I felt, the entirety of this game. And it's almost like once he won the pawn, it became a little harder for him. Time was getting low. It was a scramble to make move 40. And speaking of the importance of those 40 moves, this next move by Vidit, uh, right at the time control, so he barely got the move off, it was actually a serious mistake, and it allowed Fabi's rook from h5, which was the big problem piece for him, to go to c5 and have this really nice tactic, rook takes c6 and queen d8 check to win black's rook. And because of that tactic, the coordination came back, felt like Fabi was re-energized to go for the win again. Yeah, and then he's just converting this extra pawn. Um, here he hesitated to push it because there was a very dangerous looking sacrifice on g4, but he actually could have allowed it if he had seen that the move knight g1 still wins. He thought it was too dangerous. He went for this, but um, the engine didn't love it, but it still gave him a great chance to win the game. Um, and he actually won 
pretty easily from this position. Yeah, after rook e4, I think he came up with a great sequence, queen d5 and b5. And black just has so many issues. The rook is being hit, the a5 knight is now under attack from the queen and the rook laterally, plus the black king is not safe either. So you're just getting hit from every direction. And I think this game was kind of a masterclass from Fabi of just applying pressure on both sides of the board. He had a positional, he had a highly theoretical opening, a positional element to his conversion, and then tactics to finish it off. So it just kind of felt like a complete game. Yeah, I think his game was great. Really what he needed um, to stay in the hunt for first place. He's right. still half a point behind the leading group. But, you know, suddenly his tournament, um, it looks a lot more optimistic, doesn't it? Yeah, no, he and he needed to win in this moment because, well, everyone else was winning. So yeah. if he didn't get the, the win here, he would fall to, you know, a point behind the leading pack. And that's just not good enough with a couple rounds to go. So, you know, all of Fabi, Gukash, and Hikaru set themselves up for potential success in the candidates. Yeah, it's interesting. Now we have four players in the fight for first, mm -hmm. and then four players were really just out of it. That's right. right. And now it's like this very clear separation. It's going to um, be quite interesting to see how the four players who are not fighting for first, how competitive they remain, and right. like how much resistance they offer to the guys who really need to win. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let's not forget, those, those players can spoil or create, you know, yeah. the, the champion, the winner of this event. They're not yeah. uh, just out or eliminated. And we've seen, you know, Ali Reza has just been winning a bunch of games at the end of the tournament. So, uh, you know, Vaishali as well. So many wins strung mm -hmm. together in the women's. These uh, players will absolutely be spoiling some players' tournaments. So we'll have to see. Well, tomorrow we have a rest day. And um, then we are back for rounds 13 and 14 on Saturday and Sunday with a possible tie break on Monday the 22nd. And I think, Aman, we have a great chance to see a tie break in this tournament. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak selfishly as a, as a commentator and chess fan that, you know, I would love to see tie breaks. What a, what a thrilling finish to just such a close tournament. So they might be necessary and... You know, that just might be the case. Stay tuned, guys. We have a couple more rounds, but who knows? We might have even more chess on the, on the 22nd. See you guys on Saturday.